Hey guys, this is Ben Leibovich here. We're talking about cash on cash return being a static metric and IRR being kind of a dimensional metric in that it incorporates, uh, it has perspective on time. It discounts cash flows as time goes by. And I thought the best way to showcase this or, or to show you this would be just to do a little video. So, uh, Here's an investment of $100,000. Let's just say, you know, keep it simple with numbers. You invest $100,000. Um, it's a repositioning project. Obviously, we're all in real estate, so we're talking about buying a value-add uh, proposition, repositioning it, eventually stabilizing it, and there you go. So let's just say the first year we see $3,000 of cash flow. So that's 3% cash on cash return. And by the way, here, everything is just transferring onto a 10 year frame. We're going to do Y1, 2, 3, 4, 5 over here, and all the way through 10 years over there. And I just want you to see the difference in how those numbers, the, the delta grows between those numbers. So the, the first year cash flow is going to be $3,000. Let's just say the second year cash flow is going to be $5,000. Uh, let's just say third year cash flow is going to be nine thousand dollars and let's call that stabilized okay so this building whatever it is is nine thousand dollars now whoops that's nine thousand dollars and right here uh, you see 129,000 what I've done is I show you you are getting back your hundred thousand dollar investment plus appreciation of 20 percent over the course of five years let's just say $20,000 of equity you grew on that, plus the $9,000 from the year five cash flow, okay? So that number is what that is, $129,000. So you can see the cash and cash return in terms of year by year, here it is. Now, if you add those cash and cash returns together, and that's what a lot of people like to underwrite, cumulative cash and cash, 55%, and you divide that by the five years that you hold, and that gives you a simple annualized cash on cash of 11%. A lot of even very sophisticated syndicators um, will underwrite to the annualized cash on cash, and they probably do that because their audience, uh, people investing in these deals are less sophisticated, so they, they, they that's as far as their kind of uh, scope of vision goes is the cash and cash return okay so but here's the IRR okay and the IRR formula just you know use your Excel or whatever spreadsheet you happen to be working in does the IRR and the IRR on uh, this set of cash flows is 10% now what this tells you is that there's a delta of 1% 11% here to 10% here and uh, that's not very much but let's see what happens in the 10-year frame. So we're starting out with the same investment. We're going to have the same set of cash flows. But instead of cashing out in year five and collecting that $20,000 of appreciated value, we're going to keep going in the stabilized mode. And I know I'm supposed to escalate that from year to year. I'm just trying to keep things simple, okay? And also, I want to make sure that year five and year 10 are clearly parallel so you guys can see that dynamic happening. Now, in year 10, when we exit, what's making up this 189000 Well, you're getting $100,000 back. That's right here. And then you're getting $80,000 of appreciated value. So I was kind of aggressive on that. I said, yeah, it's only 20000 the first year, but then, you know, the market comp compounds, whatever, the cap rates compress, uh, we're gonna make $80,000 in this thing, plus the $9,000 of cash flow, as if, <laughs> but we're playing with simplistic numbers here, right? So here's the cash on cash return column, okay? By the time you add this up, 160,000, uh, 160%, overall cumulative cash on cash return divide that by 10 years and you get annualized cash on cash of 16 percent but this set of cash flows only produce 12 percent internal rate of return which tells you that now we started out with a delta of one percent in the five year to 10 year the delta has grown to four percent that's why it makes such a dramatic difference whether we're talking about cash and cash 
or IRR. Now, of course, the reason you are observing this is because time value of money is such that the longer from your date of investment you are pushing out and holding this investment, pushing out the cash flows, the more discounted those cash flows will be in the internal rate of return. That's what it does, is it discounts future cash flows to net present value, okay? In terms of today's buying power, what this says is that these, the, this set of cash flows on an investment of $100,000, in terms of today's buying power, generates 12% cash on cash return. In terms of today's buying power, you could, you could look at IRR that way. Okay, so it's important to know this distinction. The other thing, of course, the, the, the main point I try to stress is, of course, and this is kind of an overflow, so to speak, of the logic, but if you focus on underwriting the IRR, then you, you kind of have to project your exit. I mean, like, that's the whole point of underwriting the IRR. Right, because the formula, the IRR form, cash and cash, you can do whatever you want, but the formula in the IRR is not even going to be able to complete itself unless you enter a value in the final disposition. In other words, that investment cycle has to be closed. So you have to project. It forces you to project when, how, and why you're going to get the money back that you think you're going to get back. But it makes you think about that. And that's hugely important because most people, when they buy income producing property, all they think is, okay, I'm going to have income this year, income the next year, income the year after. That's nice and dandy, but what about the exit? Are you never going to exit? And by the way, you see on this a little page here, never exit is, in the majority of cases, not a really good option. Sometimes it is. But vast majority of cases, it's not because your rate of return erodes the longer the money sits in it, right? So, you know, when you get ready to exit, when you've done everything you need to do, you're ready to slow down and pass this stuff off to your kids and you're not going to trade anymore and you're, you're done, you buy high, high, high quality of asset and you just hold it, that's a different scenario. I mean, the... the in the world of assets, out of a thousand assets that you will buy in your life, maybe one will be of such quality that you will never want to sell it. You know what I'm saying. But anyhow, I'm hoping that this helped you a little bit um, with kind of visualizing the expense of time. And also note, you know, most people want to underwrite a five-year hold on real estate, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of those reasons is you really don't lose that much in terms of time value. As you can see, it's 11% cash on cash, but it's, you know, almost 11, practically 11% in terms of IRR. The difficulties with IRR really start when you begin to push it into six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and past years you know the investment so but the problem is you got to be cognizant of where you are in the real estate cycle right it may not be wise to underwrite five-year holds and i'll just leave it at that talk to you next time bye-bye